I've received many requests for a detailed explanation of Mike's ideal routine. While working with Mike on his final book, High Intensity Training, The Mike Menser Way, we devoted an entire chapter to it. So I'm going to draw from it for the following presentation. Mike taught that while the principles of productive exercise are universal and apply to all human beings, each of us must work out the practical application of how much volume and frequency we can employ for best results. In other words, we need to create our own training routines. While there's no need for me to go into the principles that underpin Mike's approach to training, as there are more than enough videos on this channel for the viewer to learn this directly from Mike himself, I will touch on some of them after presenting the recommended workout program. The routine that follows is radically different from the type you may be accustomed to reading about elsewhere online. The first thing that will strike you about it is that it is very brief. The second thing is that, compared to most bodybuilding programs, the workouts are performed very infrequently. However, this is as it must be, as it is very demanding, but this is also what makes it so productive. This high degree of difficulty necessitates that the workouts be brief and performed infrequently. The following workouts are to be performed with two days of rest in between each one. That is, you will be working out every third day. After a brief warm-up, which I will discuss after presenting the workouts, you will perform but one set to failure of each of the exercises indicated. The first workout is chest and back. Training chest first, you will start with the pec deck exercise. If you don't have access to a pec deck machine, you can use either cable crossovers or flat bench dumbbell flies. According to Mike, to utilize the pec deck, sit down inside the machine and position your lower arms perpendicular to the floor with your forearms flat against the movement pads. Push evenly against both pads at once ending the rep when the movement arms meet in the middle. Pause in the contracted position, then perform the negative part of the movement under full muscular control. Perform one set of 6 to 10 repetitions until failure. If you are using dumbbell flies as the isolation exercise for the pecs, here is Mike's recommendation. With the dumbbells together over the face, lower them to the sides with the elbows pulled back and out to the sides. Lower to a position just below the plane of the torso and no further, or you might injure your shoulder. Keeping the angle in the elbows consistent throughout the raising of the weight back to the top will stress the pecs, preserve the tricep strength, and reduce strain on the connective tissue in the crook of the elbow. It doesn't matter if the weights touch at the top since at that point, there is no resistance to fight against anyway. Move immediately upon completion of one set of 6 to 10 repetitions in this exercise to the point of muscular failure to the next exercise. Incline press. This is the compound exercise that will call into play the fresh strength of the triceps to aid in working the pecs, which were pre-fatigued by the flies. Since the pecs will be exhausted from the flies, you won't be able to use as much weight in this exercise as usual. With a shoulder width grip, lower the bar to the neck slowly, with the elbows pointed directly out to the side. It is the position of the elbows, more than the hand spacing, that places the greatest stress on the pecs. A common training mistake is to do this exercise with a wide hand spacing, with the idea that this stretches the pecs more. Actually, just the opposite is true. A closer hand spacing causes the pecs to stretch and work over a greater range of motion. As proof, witness how little the humerus, or upper arm, which is the insertion point for the pecs, moves in a wide grip incline or regular bench press. Since the function of the pecs is to bring the upper arm into and across the midline of the torso, the elbows must be held out to the sides so the pecs can perform their function in this exercise. Perform one set of one to three repetitions until failure. Next, we move on to training the back using one set of close grip, palms up, pull downs. The underhand grip is used because it places the biceps into their strongest position. 
Most bodybuilders use the palms down overhead grip that places the biceps in a weak position, limiting the degree to which you can work your back. Another mistake made by bodybuilders is using the wide grip in the pull-down and in chinning movements. Rather than stretch the lats, which is the logic behind using the wide grip, the wide grip actually reduces the stretch or the range of motion over which the lats contract. Place your upper arm up by your head and feel how much the lats are stretched, and then lower it to the side as in a wide grip position, and you'll see that the stretch is greatly diminished. Pull the bar from overhead into the chest around the nipple area, hold for a pause, and return slowly to the top. Perform one set of 6 to 10 repetitions until failure. The final exercise of the day is deadlifts. This is the most stressful exercise of the entire program, along with squats, for it involves the most muscles. The considerable stresses involved make the deadlift the most productive exercise of all. The best way to visualize the proper performance of the deadlift is to imagine it as a combination of a deep knee bend and toe touch. Start with the barbell rolled back flush against the shins. Then grasp it with a slightly wider than shoulder width grip. You can use a regular grip, or if the weight is really heavy, use an over-under grip in which one palm faces forward and the other backward for greater strength. Bend down in such a manner that your shoulders are higher than your hips or buttocks. And most importantly, keep your back flat and your head up. With arms perfectly straight and no jerking or pulling, stand up with the bar until your body is perpendicular to the ground. There is no good reason to arch backwards at the top. Upon reaching the top, pause briefly and lower under control to the floor in the same manner as you lifted, back flat and head up. Once the barbell is on the floor, reassume the proper form, reset psychologically, take a deep breath, and repeat. This exercise works every muscle on the back side of the body, from the calves to the leg biceps, the gluteus, hips, spinal erectors, latissimus, deltoids, arms, really, every muscle of the body. Mike used to say, quote, if I could only choose one exercise, it would be deadlifts, close quote. Because, again, it is the most intense or demanding, and therefore the most productive. It is very stimulating not just for the muscles, but for all of the physiological subsystems, including the cardiovascular system. Perform one set of 5 to 8 reps until failure. After the workout, you will take two days off, and on the third day, you will train your legs and abdominals. The first exercise for legs will be leg extensions on a leg extension machine. To perform this exercise, sit firmly in the seat with your back against the pad. Position so that your lower legs hang freely, with the back of the knees at the edge of the seat pad. Adjust the machine or your position so that the area, just slightly above the front of the ankles, makes contact with the pads of the movement arm. While grasping the handles lightly to stabilize yourself, move against the ankle pads evenly and deliberately so that the lower legs move out and up until your knees are locked and you're in the straight-legged position. Pause for two seconds and then lower under control. This is the perfect exercise for isolating and working the quadriceps on the front of the thighs. Perform one set of 12 to 20 repetitions until failure. The leg extension is very valuable in that it focuses the stress almost entirely on the frontal thigh muscles. This isolation of those muscles is important because the strength of the adjacent muscle groups like adductors on the inside of the thighs and the buttocks is preserved for the second exercise to follow, leg presses. When performing exercises such as leg presses or squats, the weaker adjacent muscle groups such as the hips, lower back, or buttocks give out first. Doing the leg extensions first makes use of the pre-exhaust principle, so that when you go immediately to the second exercise, the leg presses, the adjacent muscle groups will have a temporary strength advantage, and the thigh muscles can go to a point of failure without the weaker adjacent muscles giving out first. The next exercise, performed immediately after the leg extensions with zero rest, is the leg press. Place your feet shoulder width or slightly wider than shoulder width on the footboard and point them out a bit. 
Your hips should be placed so you feel stable while bending your legs. Bend your legs, lowering your thighs, until they almost hit the chest, but no lower. Going any lower will hyperextend the lower back muscles and make them prone to injury. This can and will happen with any deviation from strict controlled exercise performance. For safety, particularly when the weights really start getting heavy, you should fold your arms over your chest to prevent severe compression of the thorax when the weight descends. You can also keep your hands on your upper thighs throughout the movement so that if you lapse or lose control, you can use the strength of your arms in getting the weight safely back to the starting position. Not only does this exercise work the quadriceps or frontal thighs, it works the gracilis and semitendinosus on the inside of the upper leg and the back of the legs, the biceps femoris, as well. Perform one set of 12 to 20 repetitions until failure. The only part of the legs left to work is the lower leg, the calves or gastrocnemius. If training in a commercial gym, use a standing calf machine if one is available. Step under the shoulder pads and place the balls of your feet onto the crossboard, which is several inches off the ground. With your body perfectly straight and knees absolutely locked, raise up on the balls of your feet as high as you can go. This is important as it makes for a full, high-intensity contraction, which is necessary for full stimulation of the muscle. Having achieved that position, hold it for two to three seconds, then lower under control. Perform one set of 12 to 20 repetitions until failure. Now on to the abdominals. And the exercise you will be using will be sit-ups. Sit-ups can be done on any of the innumerable new machines available for abdominal training in most health clubs. At home, they can be done on a sit-up board or on the floor with your feet held down by a spotter or by placing them under anything that will stabilize you. With regular sit-ups, be sure to bend the knees to a 45-degree angle and keep your arms folded across your chest. Performing them in this manner will help remove unnecessary stress from the lower back. Having assumed the proper position, sit up, curl at the waist, until your torso is just shy of being perpendicular to the floor, with tension still on the abdominal muscles. When you can do more than 20 reps with your body weight, Hold a barbell plate in your folded arms, at the chest, so that you're only able to do 10 to 12 reps. Stay with that new weight until you can do 20. Unlike the other exercises where more weight can be handled, increase the weight by only 5 pounds when the upper limit of the prescribed rep range has been reached. Increasing the weight by 10% will be impossible without special equipment or until you're handling 50 pounds or more in this exercise. That is the workout. Now take two days off and return to the gym on day three where you will be training shoulders and arms. You will begin with shoulders. The muscles that cap our shoulders derive their name deltoid from the fourth letter in the Greek alphabet, delta. Our deltoids are comprised of three rather distinct portions, the anterior, lateral, and posterior portions, which, taken together, form a delta, or triangular shape. Each of the three deltoid heads possesses a function. The frontal, or anterior portion, is designed to raise the arm to the front of the body upon contraction. The lateral, or middle head, lifts the arm to the side and away from the body, while the posterior portion of the deltoid muscle pulls the arm behind the plane of the torso when it contracts. When aiming for complete and total development of the deltoid muscle, all three heads must be made to perform their natural function of moving the upper arm in some direction away from the torso. Therefore, we will have to perform different exercises in our deltoid workout if we wish for complete development. The exercises that we will have to concentrate on to get at all three heads will be raises of different sorts, with the exception of the anterior portion of the delts, which receives ample stimulation from the dumbbell fly incline press pre-exhaust training from workout one. The exercises in this workout are the standing lateral raise to hit the side or lateral head of the delt and the rear or bent over lateral raise for the posterior portion of the delt. The lateral raise is by far the best exercise for developing that important lateral head of the deltoid. 
While holding a dumbbell in each hand, rest the dumbbells to the sides of your thighs, palms facing your thighs. With a slight bend in the elbows, raise them from that position until your arms are parallel to the ground. Don't raise them to the front, but laterally, directly up from the side of the body. This is the only delt exercise for which I might recommend a slightly looser style of performance than that described for most exercises. If you don't use a slight thrust in the beginning of this movement just to get the weight started, you won't be able to employ a weight heavy enough to provide the necessary resistance in the top or contracted position of the exercise. Do not, however, use a weight that requires a ridiculously sloppy style. With only a very slight jerk, keep the weight moving with the work of the muscles and hold it at shoulder level for a distinct pause. If you cannot hold it there, remember, you used momentum instead of muscle to perform the work. From the top, lower slowly and feel the weight all the way back to the starting position. Perform one set of 6 to 10 repetitions until failure. You can take a brief rest, say 60 seconds, and then proceed to the next deltoid exercise, bend over dumbbell laterals. While bending over at the waist with a slight bend in the knees, with the torso parallel to the floor, raise the dumbbells until the arms move as far above the torso as possible. Pause, and then lower under control. Do 6 to 10 repetitions. That concludes the shoulder workout. From there, we proceed to the biceps. As your biceps were worked quite thoroughly with the close grip underhand pulldowns in your chest and back workout, you may wish to use this exercise again. If not, then a regular barbell curl will suffice. It is easy to slip into a very loose style when doing the regular curl, so be especially cautious here to perform your first six reps with no sudden jerk or cheat. Standing behind the barb, bend down with your back straight and head up. Grasp the bar with a shoulder-width grip and stand up. Without any sudden jerking, yanking, or thrusting to get the weight started, curl the bar under strict control while keeping your elbows tucked in at the waist. Allow the arms to extend fully at the bottom and curl all the way to the contracted position where the bar touches the clavicles. Upon reaching the top, pause only slightly and lower under control. You will notice that the hardest part of the curl is at the point when the forearms are in a position perfectly parallel to the floor. This is the only point in the range of motion where you have direct resistance, because here you will be pulling straight up while the bar is being pulled straight down. It is important that you fight the weight through that point rather than lean back with the body as leverage to help. Perform one set of 6 to 10 repetitions until failure. The majority of bodybuilders believe the only function of the biceps to be the flexion of the forearm, that is, bringing the forearm from an extended position to a flexed one closer to the upper arm. This is actually the secondary function of the biceps. Its primary function is to supinate the hand or turn the palm up. Before the biceps can fulfill its secondary function of flexing the forearm, its primary function of supinating the hand must be fulfilled first. What this means for the bodybuilder is that the palms must be facing directly up when performing biceps work. In order to achieve this position, a straight barbell or dumbbell must be employed. The easy curl or cambered bar, which so many bodybuilders use, is actually counterproductive in working the biceps as it causes the hands to be placed away from the supine towards a prone position. Always use a palms up grip then when working the biceps and perform the exercise through a full range of motion from full extension to full contraction. These two bits of information are vital if you want to get the most from your biceps training. Now we move on to the triceps. The primary function of the triceps is to extend the forearm, and its secondary function is to bring the upper arm into the body, having fulfilled its primary function. There are very few ways of working both functions of the triceps with conventional equipment. The best two exercises for doing that are the triceps press down on the lat machine and the dip between parallel bars. These two exercises will be focused on here and should be included in all arm routines. It would be possible to stimulate 100% of the biceps and triceps bulk or any muscle's entire bulk 
if we would exercise them with direct resistance over their full range of motion. We would need to employ exercise, in other words, that provided resistance for both functions of the muscle. Since there is no conventional exercise equipment that will do that, we must employ two exercises designed to work each of the tricep muscle's various functions. The first tricep exercise is triceps press downs. Since this exercise causes you to extend the forearms with the upper arms already held into the body, you work the two functions of the triceps mentioned earlier. This double-barreled action is very important in working all three heads of the triceps. With a machine similar to the lat pull-down, grasp the bar in front of you with a close grip, hands 8 inches apart, with your elbows tucked in at the sides of your waist. There should be no traveling of the upper arms away from the tucked at the waist stable position, or the pectorals and latissimus dorsi will come into play. Extend the bar downwards with the body held straight up, so the body leverage does not aid in the movement. Lock the elbows firmly at the bottom and pause momentarily before allowing the bar to return slowly to the extended position. Perform 6 to 10 repetitions until failure and then immediately perform the next exercise. Dips. Veteran trainees think of dips as the upper body squat. Mike often said that it is so productive that if he had to choose one exercise for the upper body, it would be dips. Observe the gymnasts who specialize on the parallel bars. They possess pectorals, deltoids, and triceps similar in development to that of a bodybuilder's. This exercise will be utilized in the development of the triceps in much the same way that incline presses were used for the pectorals. After carrying a set of press downs to a point of momentary failure, a set of dips will follow immediately so that we can call upon the strength of the pectorals and frontal deltoids to aid the triceps in continuing to contract, even though they are fatigued from the initial isolation exercise. The rest between the two exercises must be literally zero, lest the triceps recover their strength and render the principle of pre-fatigue inoperative. Dips performed for the triceps should be done with the elbows held in close to the body and the legs held slightly back away from the body so that you are tipped forward. As with all exercise, perform the dips in a slow and deliberate manner, going all the way down at the bottom and locking the elbows at the top. Perform one set of three to five repetitions until failure. That concludes this workout. Now take two days off and return to the gym on day three, where you will work legs and abs again. The only difference between these two workouts is that in this leg workout, the leg press exercise will be substituted with squats. Here is how Mike recommended you perform squats. Place the bar on the upper back, below the nape of the neck, across the trapezius. With feet slightly wider than shoulder width and angled outward, descend in a deep knee bend fashion with your back flat and head up until the thighs are parallel to the ground and no lower. Then, immediately, without any bouncing, begin a controlled ascent to the top, straight-legged position. Once you've reached the top, pause only long enough to take a deep breath and repeat. This works all of the thigh muscles together, though primarily the frontal quad muscles, and, as you'll discover, serves to greatly stimulate the cardiovascular system. However, do not drop rapidly into a rock-bottom position where your buttocks are almost touching the ground, and then bounce back up. Such a loose style of performance is a surefire prescription for injury. Remember, this is high-intensity, low-force exercise, the ideal, safest exercise possible when done correctly. As the squats involve the use of much heavier weights and can be dangerous to the lower back if proper caution isn't exercised, it is best to choose a weight that allows approximately 12 to 20 repetitions and stop at the point of positive failure rather than go on to total failure with forced and negative repetitions. Also, the use of a power rack with strong safety pins or a special machine with safety catches such as a Smith machine is advised. Once you complete this workout, take two days off and return to the gym on day three and repeat the workout cycle again, starting with chest and back. That explains the workouts. Now let's move on to some additional elements. Warming up. Make sure that you spend some time warming the muscles to be worked. However, it is not necessary to stretch the muscles, perform aerobic work, or engage in any more exercise than is minimally required to limber up and increase the blood flow 
to the specific muscles you're working that day. Using the deadlift as an example, if you're able to handle 165 pounds for 7 reps on your working set, start your warm-up with 115 pounds for 7 to 10 easy reps to get the blood flowing into the area, and then one more set with 145 pounds for 2 or 3 reps to mentally prepare you for the heavier set to follow. Where pre-exhaust cycles are listed, start the warm-up with the second exercise. For example, warm-up with leg presses in the case of the leg extension leg press pre-exhaustion cycle. This will ensure that you'll have warmed up all the necessary muscles, including the quadriceps for the leg extensions, and enable you to preset the leg press weight. If you don't warm up with leg presses, which works multiple muscles simultaneously, and instead start with the leg extension, your auxiliary muscles will be cold and the weight won't be preset, making it difficult to move with no rest directly to the leg press station. Warm-up needs will vary among individuals according to age, existing condition, and of course, the temperature of the gym you work out in. Keep in mind, too, that the first few reps of this high-intensity, low-force program serve as a further warm-up. The guiding principle here is, perform the minimal amount of exercise required to achieve an actual warm-up. But now that you have the program, there's something else you need to know. As you grow stronger over time, the stresses you will be exposed to will grow progressively greater too. If something isn't done to compensate for the increasing stresses, those stresses will eventually reach a critical point and will constitute overtraining. The first symptom of overtraining will be a slowdown in your progress, and if you continue with the same volume and frequency protocol, there will ultimately be a complete cessation of progress. This is known to athletes as a sticking point. Compensating for the increasing stresses is rather simple. At the first sign of a slowdown in progress, cease training entirely for two weeks so your body has a chance to fully restore its recovery ability. Upon resumption of training, add an extra day or two of rest between workouts. Substitute less demanding exercises and or periodically eliminate an exercise from your training sessions. For example, every second or third workout for the chest and back Eliminate the deadlifts and perform the less demanding shrugs. On shoulder and arm day, drop the dips periodically and just do the triceps press downs. And on leg day, drop the leg extensions and just do the leg presses, calf raises, and sit-ups. While you may be tempted to say that a one-set decrease may not be much, consider that there are relatively few exercises in the program to begin with, so one less set will represent a significant percentage decrease. Individual exercise stress tolerance is a genetically mediated trait, and like all such traits, it is expressed across a broad continuum. Those with greater innate adaptability can train more than those with less. Your best friend will be your progress chart. Lack of progress is almost never due to too little exercise, but too much. If progress is not immediate after a reduction of training frequency, take a two- to three-week layoff, and then resume training with even lesser frequency. During periods of physical change or progress, your training requirements must change. Case in point, Mike had a number of personal training clients who were training only once every 10 to 14 days. Now let's examine some of Mike's reasons that led to the formulation of this routine. First, why only one set per exercise? Simply because one set has been established as being sufficient to stimulate muscle growth. It's like when you throw the switch to turn on a light. Once you've thrown the switch, you're confident that the electrical mechanism is in motion. You don't stand there all day flipping the switch up and down, do you? Moreover, each additional set represents an additional energy expenditure to recover from. The more sets you perform, the longer it takes to recover. Precision was a big thing with Mike, who believed in doing the precise amount of exercise necessary to do the job, as any more than that was unnecessary and represented needless time spent in the gym. Second, why less reps on the incline press and dips? The incline press and dips are part of a pre-exhaustion cycle in which you are attempting to overcome the weak links of smaller muscle groups in targeting larger muscle groups. For example, the pectoral muscles are bigger and stronger than the triceps, but since the triceps are involved in most chest exercises, such as the bench press, dips, and incline press, 
If you perform an isolation exercise first, such as a pec deck or dumbbell flies, and follow up immediately with a compound exercise, such as incline presses, the triceps, being fresh and untapped, will allow you to squeeze out a few extra contractions from the pectoral muscles, recruiting and stimulating more of the pectoral muscles than you would otherwise be able to do if you had just used the compound exercise on its own, or for that matter, the isolation exercise on its own. Consequently, rather than using a lighter weight and recycling through the fibers you have already recruited and stimulated until you get to the final few reps, performing the exercise with a heavier weight after exhausting the pectorals with the pec deck is almost the equivalent of doing a couple of forced repetitions, and fewer reps are therefore required. Consider it a form of cleanup set, where you are ensuring that you have hit as many chest muscle fibers as possible. Third. Why work out once every three days? This was a starting frequency that Mike found to be good for beginners, who have not yet developed the strength to drain their energy systems as thoroughly as they will when they are stronger. However, as you grow stronger, you will in effect be digging a deeper hole into your energy reserves, and the deeper the hole, the longer it takes to refill it. This is why you will need to add rest days in between workouts as you get stronger. I recall asking him when he was finishing up the writing for Heavy Duty 1 if he was going to include a specific workout for everyone based upon what he had learned from training hundreds of clients. He replied that, I can't, can't issue a, a sure fire prescription for everybody. Right. Uh, the, the general theory, again, advanced by Jones, is valid. The practical application will, will vary because of this great range of variation that exists among individuals with regard to individual tolerance of exercise. I have a 44-year-old client, for instance, John, that understands the theory, but he still wants to work out every day. After talking to him, I was blue in the face, and he said, I want to train anyway. I said, okay, I'll take your money if you want me to be in the gym with you. Yeah. He trains every day, and he still makes progress. On the other hand, I had a, a young kid who's 21. You would think he'd have perhaps a stronger constitution. Mm-hmm. I had him down to three, or uh, at the most, four sets per workout every four fucking days and he was still overtraining. <laughs> you know, just as people vary enormously with regards to height and weight and intelligence and every other genetic trait, I'm beginning to see how widely people vary in regards to recovery ability. Some people just cannot tolerate exercise more than once every several, maybe even ten days. Training to Grow Intensity versus volume, or training for hypertrophy versus training for endurance. In exercise, there is a continuum with endurance at one side and strength and size at the other. These are two distinct results from training that can be produced, and each requires a specific way to train. When you're doing specifically high-intensity training, you're training specifically for muscular mass. You can train specifically for muscular mass or specifically for cardiovascular Increase. This is where the term specificity of training comes in. If you want to train specifically for cardiovascular fitness, then you've got to do highly repetitive, low intensity exercise. High intensity training does not build the kind of cardiovascular fitness that low intensity training does. You've got to train with low intensity, highly repetitive activities, jogging, bicycle, and so forth. You will develop a certain amount of as opposed to not doing any kind of activity. But it's not in the same order as real road training. You've got to train specifically for one or the other. You can divide specificity and train a little bit for building uh, size and mass and a little bit for cardiovascular, but you won't improve as rapidly as if you can train specifically for one or the other. In other words, you have a certain amount of adaptive ability. You, you can divide it 100% or give it 100% towards developing mass or give it 100% towards developing cardiovascular fitness. Or you can divide it in half. Give half of it to developing cardiovascular fitness and give it half to developing mass. But you won't improve as rapidly in either area by doing it that way. If you want to develop muscles as fast as you can, then train specifically for size and mass. If you want to develop cardiovascular fitness as fast as you can, train specifically for that. Don't divide it in two. It's impossible to obtain a certain type of result when you're training in a fashion that stimulates the production of its opposite. 
as Mike defined the terms, anaerobic is high-intensity, brief duration, like sprinting. The faster you run, the less distance you can run. That is, the briefer the activity must be. Aerobic is just the opposite. Low-intensity, long duration, like marathon running. The less intensely or quickly you run, the more distance you can run. That is, the longer the activity can be carried on for. However, if you train for long periods, multiple exercises, multiple sets, multiple days per week, you are training for an endurance adaptation. If, by contrast, you train as intensely as you can, you will end up training for short periods, few exercises, low sets, only a few days a week, perhaps one or two, or if your ability to tolerate intense exercise is higher than most, perhaps three days. The thing is, you don't know going into this enterprise where your tolerance level falls on the continuum, which is mediated by your genetics. To find out, Mike recommended that you keep a training logbook, which records your workout progress or lack thereof. If your weights and repetitions are increasing, then you know you are recovering and adapting to the training stress using whatever training volume and frequency you are presently employing. If you are not making progress in weights and reps, then you are allowing enough time for recovery, but not enough time for adaptation or growth. And if you're getting weaker, that is, your repetitions and weights are going down, then you're not allowing enough time to pass for recovery to take place. That's a snapshot of the process. In other videos on this channel, Mike goes into greater detail about this if you should wish to explore the matter further.